Medical professionals, what's something ridiculous you've had to explain to your patients? Story from 2015 to an 84-year-old man with a candlestick in his rectum that you don't need to massage your prostate with a candle once a month. A doctor had apparently told him 15 years ago to do this, and he had not questioned it since. I was going to say, well, it was a different time, but then I realized 15 years ago was the year 2000. September changed a lot of things, man. Firefighter slash EMT here. Just because you're taking medication for something doesn't mean it's going to go away. Here's a real conversation that happens about once or twice per shift at minimum. Me. Do you have any medical history, diseases, sicknesses, and or conditions I should be aware of? Patient. No. Are you currently taking or supposed to be taking any medications? Yeah, I'm on, insert 12 different medications here. Ah, I see one of your medications is metformin. Are you a diabetic? Not anymore, I just told you I take meds for it. Me. Sigh. I had to explain to my 75-year-old grandmother that there isn't one straight tube connecting your ears. She put eardrops in, put cotton in her other ear before she laid down so it wouldn't leak out the other side. Those instructions must have gone in one ear and out the other. Having to explain that I can't figure out what's wrong with them over the phone. My mom called me and asked me what the rash on her elbow was. After five minutes of trying to explain that I needed to see the rash, I finally asked her what she thought of the shirt I was wearing. Took her a couple of seconds to figure it out. I mean, that's just a special level of ignorance right there. In the words of Ron Burgundy, I'm not even angry. I'm impressed. You're more likely to die from a dental abscess than dental x-rays. Dr. Oz is full of crap. I also hate it when people say, well, if they're so safe, then why do you step out of the room? And they act like it's freaking stumped me. The reason I step out of the room when taking x-rays is because I do that almost every day. You get it once every three years. I don't know if this is a good analogy, but you equate it to a bartender asked to share his drink with a customer. You can have a drink every once in a while, but if the bartender has to drink with every customer, he'd be very sick. Overweight lady with some liver damage. Had many conversations about diet and reducing alcohol intake. Patient had cut out whiskey and vodka, but did not know that Guinness had alcohol. Yes, this was in rural Ireland. About no alcohol. All right, I'll just stick to Guinness then. No, that has alcohol in it. Really? But what about stout? Porter? IPA? Lager? Ale? Cider? My personal favorites are when the families of a loved one bring in food that's completely counter to their current medical condition. Off the top of my head, I've had a family bring in a get well cake to their dad, who was on his fifth or sixth admission to DKA. Diabetic ketoacidosis. He was still on an insulin infusion, and the family didn't see the problem with giving him a cake because he woke up and was hungry. I've had families order in pizza to have a pizza party when their parent is admitted on the cardiology ward and on a salt and fluid restricted diet due to extensive heart failure. Good times. When I had my appendix removed, every freaking body brought me food. I had to go a week without anything, and they kept bringing me food. Returning visitors, food again. Only one person brought me a book to actually pass the time. I was crying and giving the food away, and crying and giving it away. It was awful. It is hard-coded into our DNA, I suppose. Just like every grandma resolves every situation with food, thus we are bound to go down the same road. Am diabetic. I have a family that does these things. I tell them, no, I can't eat that. They insist that I can have a little bit, right? Hand me a huge slice of cake. No, I can't even eat a little bit. They try to make me feel guilty for not eating the cake they brought me. I have specific instructions now when I'm at the hospital. I'm currently under medical quarantine. I cannot be disturbed. It's weird to pretend to have MRSA. Medical professional here. I have many stories that fit the bill. One that sticks in my mind is a patient, 15-year-old kid that suffered a traumatic head injury, was in the ICU barely able to speak, obvious cognitive impairments due to the injury, and the family was strictly instructed to refrain from feeding him anything. Nothing by mouth, no water, nothing. The next morning I get an emergency page from the ICU because the patient is going into respiratory failure. I rush over to see the pulmonologist and nursing staff performing CPR on the kid. The parents are outside the room, freaking out. Sadly, the kid didn't make it. Upon the autopsy, they pulled out a pepperoni slice, crust, and green jello from the kid's lungs. It was devastating as hell to tell the kid's parents that they killed him by sneaking him in food. The kid's throat muscles were so weakened by the brain injury that most of the food was ending up in his lungs. The parents thought that the medical team wasn't feeding him for yucks. The only way they could convey their love for him at this time was to give him foods he loved. Tragic lesson learned, I hope.
That was pretty upsetting. I can't even imagine living with the knowledge of what happened. Let the rest of us know not to do this, folks. Paramedic friend of mine has had to explain to multiple people that diabetes is not something that everyone ends up getting in life. When a woman lets her diabetic son eat ridiculous amounts of sugar, then gets him to run around in the yard to burn it all off because I don't like pumping him full of all that insulin. That's not how this works, lady. Shadowed a dentist in a rural area where most patients were in poverty. One guy was so confused on why his teeth were rotting. He revealed that his diet consisted of sugar, sugar, and alcohol. The dentist had to explain sugar can lead to enamel loss. The guy said, nope, that's a lie. My wife is a dentist and had a similar patient tell her that it wasn't the sugar, but the fluoride in the water that causes decay. (sighs) I was in hospital with my girlfriend while the nurse undressed her. The nurse asked if it was all right for me to be in there. She knew we were together, and we said yes with a confused look. She then told us the story of a couple in their 80s who were in, and when she took down the wife's top to check her heartbeat, the husband covered his eyes and ran out of the room while the wife burst into tears. 40 plus years of marriage, and they'd never seen each other in the nude. That's sad. Really, really freaking sad. Taking a medication twice a day does not mean taking the doses together. One dose now, one dose later. Not both doses now. On a side note, don't give your son your sleeping medication. Ever. I remember in a country doctor's notebook, this young doctor who had just started in rural Russia, initially with no clue what the frick he was doing, and making it up as he went along for some stuff, had a patient with an infection of some sort. The guy was very smart and he enjoyed having an intellectual conversation with him, gave him the pills and sent him on his way. Then, a few days later, he saw the same guy in for a med OD. He said, It was going to take weeks taking those pills, so I decided to just take them all at once and be done with it. A side note, this was adapted into a short series starring John Hamm and Daniel Radcliffe and is available on Netflix, called A Young Doctor's Notebook. It's really great. Radcliffe does a great job as the doctor. Repeat patient of the STD clinic I work at. Isn't there something I can buy, like over-the-counter, so I don't have to keep coming back in for chlamydia? Me. Contraceptive? Dirty patient. Nah, miss, I meant like a tea or something. When the doctors or nurses tell you it's a very bad idea to leave AMA or against medical advice, you should take their advice. Several years ago when I was a phlebot, a person who drew blood, I went to the nursing station so I could grab someone to follow me into the room. The patient was given a clot-busting drug, TPA. This stuff makes heparin look like child's play, and I would need to have a nurse hold pressure on the puncture site for at least 5-10 to minutes to see if it had stopped bleeding in that time. The nurse told me stone-faced that they left AMA. After that drug, falling down could cause serious injury because you just don't clot at all. He was back in ER a short while later. Another lady decided that even though she was in the ICU, that since she got four units of blood and felt much better, it'd be okay for her to go ahead and leave. No, it's not okay. That's stupid. In nursing school, my labor and delivery teacher was covering contraceptives and demonstrated how to show patients how male contraceptives are used by putting them on our thumb. At the end of it, she emphasized, make sure you tell them that it doesn't actually go on their thumb and that the way you put it on a thumb is how it should be placed on someone's manhood. I had a patient that was truly concerned that his cancer was contagious. He wanted to know how to keep his puppy from contracting it. He was literally more concerned about his tiny puppy getting cancer because of him than his own health. I'll never forget the joy and relief I saw in his eyes when I told him he could have all the puppy cuddles he wanted. For those of you wondering, the puppy cuddles were curative. Of course. Aw man, that's super sweet. Dumb as heck, but still super sweet. For the purposes of surgery, vodka is not a clear liquid. I have been lied to by every one of my Russian homeopathic instructors and I am going to demand a refund. Ooh, I have another one. I'm a nurse in general surgery. My patient had a note in her chat to not let her have any of the cups in the room, which I thought was strange. We've had other orders before for other patients saying they weren't allowed to have any metal utensils. The patient loved to swallow spoons and forks, but that's another story. But this was something new. I quickly found out why when I walked into her room for a morning report and several cups of urine were sitting on her sink. Apparently she was too lazy to get out of bed to pee, so she had her husband sneak in some more cups to conveniently pee in. No. Peeing in a cup is not allowed. This happened multiple times after multiple talks with the patient, hence the order. 
Since I'm getting a lot of requests for the Spoon Dude, unfortunately it's not a very exciting story. He was a young gentleman in his late 20s and early 30s who came somewhat frequently to our floor for retrieving silverware from wherever it got stuck in his GI tract. Some people eat paper or laundry soap, his thing was swallowing cutlery. Once he downed several knife handles. How did he get the handles off? What drew him to these particular knives? After he ate one, what did it feel like to continue swallowing the others? So many questions. All meals were supervised for his visits. The catheter in your wang makes it feel like you have to pee, but you don't, it does it for you. No, don't just pull it out, you'll shred your bladder and seriously regret it. You're screaming right now because you're trying to pull out your catheter, please stop. No, don't throw your pee bag at me, you'll be arrested for assault. Sincerely, Hospital Security. A few years ago, I was taking care of a woman from a rural part of our state. She had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and it wasn't looking good. Her husband was kind of keeping his distance from her. As I was doing something in the corner of the room, he came up to me and whispered, I can still kiss her, right? I then had to explain that cancer is indeed not contagious and he won't catch her cancer. It was kind of heartbreaking. Oh man. Number 1. Soda has sugar. I had a diabetic man who didn't realize this. I just don't understand how it was even possible to not know this as a grown adult. He was a completely normal person otherwise, which is why it had me asking WTF. Number 2. Pouring Lysol on your diabetic foot ulcer won't keep it from getting infected. Number 3. When we said clear liquids only, like jello, water and popsicles, we did not mean that you should convince your mother to blend you some McDonald's burgers and fries so you can drink that through a straw. Number 4. Unless you've already done it at least once before, pushing a baby out of your hoo-ha will neither be a pleasant nor quick experience. Had a couple that had been trying to get pregnant for over a year without success. Turns out they did the deed once and were waiting. Per our professor, she was counseling a couple and was starting to consider doing fertility tests before it came out that the couple were using protection every single time. Probably to all our benefit. Yeah, that's like a non-lethal Darwin award. When you were told not to eat 12 hours prior to surgery, it wasn't a polite suggestion. We had a patient coming in who we told not to eat or drink anything, even water. So he drank Gatorade since we told him he couldn't have water. I worked in an ER and saw this more than once. Last case, parents brought their child in for surgery, let her eat a full breakfast because she was hungry, She vomited aspirated bacon and eggs and ended up in the ICU on a ventilator so they could irrigate all the food out of her lungs. How did the parents react? Were they shocked or was it more like, yeah, we done messed up? They were devastated. They realized they'd made a horrible mistake. It's easy to blame them, but honestly, the average person doesn't fully grasp how dangerous surgery actually is. With the county corollary of, no, you can't smoke crystal just before surgery. I bet being an anesthesiologist is a great time. Sir, do you want to wake up halfway through your surgery? Please frickin' listen to me. I shouldn't be surprised, but the amount of people who just don't pay any attention to the medical professionals caring for them is mind-boggling. From the junkies, to the idiots who believe they're homeopaths and think they know more after one bullcrap article. An executive came in once, complaining of bumps on her tongue. She was worried they might be cancer. I got to write my favorite encounter note thus far in my career. Complaint. Bumps on tongue. Asymptomatic. Exam. Taste buds. Assessment. Taste buds. Plan. Reassure. I'm a medical student and earlier this year I was taking a history from a patient during a bedside tutorial where a senior doctor takes a group of us to see a patient together. I was speaking to this man about his symptoms and used the correct word for male organ begins with a P, to which he gave me a confused look. I said it again and he still didn't know what I was talking about. I ended up having to ask him if he had any pain in his Johnson while peeing in front of my classmates and my tutor. Keep in mind that this guy was in his 40s. I don't work in a medical profession, but I do work in another place where terrible diseases run rampant and staff spend every waking moment fighting them off. A school. There was nothing more bizarre than explaining germ theory to a teacher. She honestly didn't believe that such a thing could exist. She sincerely believed that sicknesses were caused by negative energy and bad auras, and insisted that it was fundamentally impossible for something as small as a germ to harm something as large as a human body, if something that small could even be alive in the first place. She spouted off something about how a creature that small would be incapable of living for more than a few seconds because 
energy can only get so small and a germ, she did finger quotes, could only hold energy to live for one or two seconds at most. These are the people educating your kids. For everyone asking what she taught, grades one to three. Not exactly the kind of place I'd worry about her voodoo even needing to be brought up, but it shook my faith in her ability to be objective about other things, so I'm still uncertain. I mean, imagine if she was convincing an entire class of third graders that they do not need to wash their hands. Caring for a woman in her 80s, I had to explain to her that you don't pee out of your hoo-ha. There is, in fact, another hole. I'm a veterinarian and I don't understand owners sometimes. I work at a clinic of a vet who's also a private animal nutritionist, so sometimes we do house calls for special cases. Client Bob's dog isn't eating well and he has no clue why. I go over and ask him to show me his feeding routine for his dog. He fills a bowl with kibble and the dog seems super excited to eat. I crap you not, he then goes over to the fridge, takes out the ketchup and drenches the kibble with ketchup. By this point, my jaw is hanging open in shock, and I can see that the dog has suddenly lost its enthusiasm for the meal. I ask Bob politely what he's doing, and he tells me that his entire family has ketchup on every meal. I then spend the next 15 minutes explaining to him that his dog may not like ketchup on its food. Now the dog eats great, and apparently I'm a miracle worker. I work at a vet clinic on weekends, and the amount of junk people feed their pets on a regular basis is astounding. I kid you not, we had a lady board her dog with us for the weekend. She bought toys, treats, bedding, even though we have our own and prefer to use that in case theirs is damaged or lost, but no food. Not a problem, we have food here and we even have tricks to make them eat, like putting some canned ID with their food. She gives our receptionist $40 and says, Here's the money for his chicken McNuggets, he likes those, feed him 10 pieces a day. The receptionist flat out told this woman no and even bought the vet out to explain why we would not do that at our facility. I totally thought that the story was going to be dog won't eat kibble, owner doesn't understand why, turns out dog has been eating three course meals with owner, but he hasn't eaten his food for days. That's actually not too far off from what I see sometimes. Family will feed their dog copious amounts of table scraps and then wonder why he never touches the dog food. And oh, why he has pancreatitis. And now back to human beings, folks. Sticking the blade of a steak knife in your butt won't cure your constipation. I really wish this was a joke. That just because you take medication that controls your ailments, it doesn't mean you don't have them anymore. I ask plenty of older people if they have any medical history and frequently get no as an answer, only to look at their med list and find out they're on a dozen medications. Why do you take this blood pressure medication? Oh, because I used to have high blood pressure. Nope, not how it works. That yes, guys can be nurses too. I'm a guy, and nurse. No, I'm not a doctor. Yes, maybe I should have been a doctor instead. Or maybe a woman should be a doctor instead if she likes it more. Paramedic here. I had to tell a 19-year-old that she needed to change her tampon more than once a month. She was in septic shock, by the way. I'm a guy. Even I know you've got to change that crap out. My sister is an ER doctor in Chicago. She once had to explain to a Mormon couple on their wedding night how to do the deed. The 19-year-old man had taken his 18-year-old bride into the ER, convinced his wife didn't have a hoo-ha. She also had to tell a mother of four that giving your children a heavy dose of vodka did not kill the bacteria in their bodies when they got colds. She also had to report that, obviously. She found a very frightened 23-year-old girl who came into the ER very afraid because she had found a growth in her crotch. It was her pleasure button. When my sister was asking her how she had never noticed it before, the girl responded, My mom told me that if I touched my area, that the devil would get me. The girl had lived for 23 years without ever touching or seeing her own hoo-ha. I guess when she would wipe, she would just blot the outside quickly or something? A female patient came in and told the doctor that she had been bleeding every month down there, thinking it had something to do with the birth of her daughter. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough the importance of teaching this stuff in schools. Two things. One is to take all the medication even if you feel better at day three. And two, you do not give your kid the leftover medication from part one when he has the same symptoms a week later. Wanting someone to make you a cup of tea is not a good reason to call an ambulance. For everyone asking, yes, I made the tea. After a half hour blue light run, might as well. Left to my own devices, I wouldn't have made that tea. I was a student at the time and was told to do so by my mentor. In the UK, social care is part of our remit, so it kind of makes sense. I work in a hospital. 
I was getting some history from this lady when she told me she was allergic to epinephrine, i.e. adrenaline. You know, the stuff in EpiPens that you give to people when they have an allergic reaction to stop anaphylaxis reaction. So I asked her what reaction she had last time she was given epinephrine, and she told me that it made her heart race, and she couldn't settle down. Had to explain to her that that means it worked. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot, linked in the description too. Either way, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.